All right, Hotep, how's everybody doing? Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, host of the African History Network show, founder of the African History Network. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Today is Saturday, January 5th, 2019. And uh, we're live here. We're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Um, and then also on YouTube as well. So those watching on Facebook, share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also. All right, so um, I wanted to talk about the uh, Rosewood Massacre that took place in January, 1923, all right? And so this month is the anniversary of the Rosewood uh, Massacre taking place. And uh, many of us have seen the uh, movie Rosewood that came out in uh, 1997, starring Ving Rhames and um, uh, uh, oh, it was Ving Rhames and um, he had some other people, Esther Rowe uh, and, and others in, in the film, okay, John Voight. Um, but there's some that the movie is based upon a true story, but the real history of it is different than some of the things depicted in the movie. All right. And the incident started on January 1st, 1923. And the Rosewood massacre took place. Yeah, Don Cheadle, uh, place of Vester. Uh, the Rosewood, the Rosewood massacre took place because of a lie. The Rosewood massacre took place because a white woman lied on a fictitious African-American man. A white woman lied on a fictitious African-American man, okay? Now, this is, I'm not, this is not a wholesale indictment of all white women, but there is a history of white women, white people, but white women lying on African-American men. OK, there is a history about of this. All right. So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Uh, email us at customer service at African History Network dot com. Customer service at African History Network dot com. And um, we'll post your 30 second and 60 second commercial to the audio podcast of our radio shows and our broadcast we do throughout the week. All right. So um, last month. So this is January. So in December, I saw the movie once again, Rosewood. It came on. I think it was stars or something. It came on cable. And um, I, I saw it in the theater in 97. So and it's directed by John Singleton also. So I went back and watched it. And then I was looking at um, yesterday, I was looking at some dates in history. Uh, I look at Yanoba.com, Y-E-N-O-B-A, Yanoba.com, and also um, uh, the History Channel, History.com. I get the email from the History Channel dealing with this date in history. And I saw that yesterday was the anniversary of some of the incidents dealing with um, Rosewood. So because I saw the movie and that movie was fresh in my mind again, you know, I went and did some research last night and this morning. So let's deal with some of this history, okay? This is a real history lesson. All right, so the Rosewood Massacre was an attack on the predominantly African-American town of Rosewood, Florida, okay, in 1923. And this was done by a large group of white men. All right, now the town was entirely destroyed uh, by, uh, by the end of this violence. This violence is gonna go on for six days, okay? This violence, this, uh, this massacre takes place for six, six days and uh, the town is gonna be uh, uh, de destroyed and the residents are driven out of Rosewood permanently. I was also watching um, late, uh, late last night, I was watching a uh, segment of 2020, I'm not 2020, 60 minutes, a segment of 60 minutes, because they did a set, Ed Bradley did a segment on 60 minutes dealing with um, Rosewood also, and the history of Rosewood as well. It's on YouTube, okay? Uh, I may be able to pull it up here. And it was fascinating because some of the survivors, 
who had fled. And they, you know, a lot of them were like children at the time. Some of the survivors were, were being interviewed about what took place as well. All right. Okay, so uh, let's continue here. All right, so the town of Rosewood was also wiped off the map. African Americans fled; the ones the ones who were not killed, they fled, never to return. They left their property behind. This is the other thing. They they were homeowners; they owned land. They left their property behind. Now the story was mostly forgotten until the 1980s, when it was revived and brought into public attention, okay? And then you're gonna have a lawsuit uh, and you're gonna have the movie in 1997. Now, the town of Sumner, Florida was just a few miles away from Rosewood, Florida, all right? Rosewood was an all African-American town. You had white people who lived in Rosewood previously, but they're gonna move away because of white flight, all right? We'll come to that in just a minute. So Rosewood was, I see estimates of about 120 people lived there, African-Americans to 200, okay? Most, most estimates are around 200 African-Americans, okay? And, um, it, 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 and, and Rosewood has seen its own version of white flight after um, the uh, after the uh, uh, an industry left Rosewood and whites moved to Sumner, Florida. OK, and this dealt with um, the pencil factories. Um, you had um, employment was provided by pencil factories, but the cedar tree population, the cedar tree population soon became decimated and white families moved away in the 1890s and settled in the nearby town of Sumner, Florida. African-Americans are going to stay behind, but you're going to have some African-Americans who worked in Sumner, Florida. They lived in Rosewood, but they worked in Sumner, Florida. All right. So the town of uh, Rosewood, Florida was originally settled in 1845. Okay, 1845. This is during slavery. All right. Civil War doesn't come until 1861. And we know Florida was also one of those states that seceded from the Union. They were one of those Confederate states as well. All right. So when it settled in 1845, you have you have African Americans and white people who were living there in Sumner, Florida. All right. And then you're going to have the black codes that come, you know, after slavery ends in 1865. You have the black codes. You're going to have Jim Crow laws in the years after the Civil War. And this created segregation in Rosewood. All right. Um, so now by the 1920s, Rosewood, Rosewood's population of about 200 was entirely made up of African-American citizens, okay? Because this is after the, the, uh, the, you have the white flight because of the tree population, the cedar tree population becomes decimated and the white people move to Sumner, Florida. You still have segregation going on in the South though at this time in the 1920s, all right? Um, it, it, and, the, and there was one white family who stayed there in, in, in Rosewood, Florida, okay? That was John Wright and his family. Now, in the movie, Rosewood, that was played by John Voigt. John Voigt, he was the, um, the general store owner, okay? So he and his family were the only white people who stayed in Rosewood, all right? And he was a real character. So what you're going to see, and this is by no means an attack on John Singleton. I, I understand creative license. I understand some of the things you have to do to get a movie made, right? A a, some of the characters that are depicted in the film are real characters. And when I did this, studied this history, these were real people. The character that Ving Rhames played, however, the character, his name is Man. That's his name. When we go, when I went to IMDb, you know, because I looked at numerous sources for this information. I looked at IMDb and their entry for Rosewood to see the characters who were there. His name is Man. That's his first and last name. He was a fictitious character. He was like one of the heroes, okay? One of the real African American heroes who saved um who helped save the women and the children and fought back. He carried two forty-five caliber handguns. He was a former World War I veteran. He was a fictitious character. But I understand that John Singleton probably felt the need to create this fictitious character to be a hero 
because the way the way the massacre actually took place is different than the way it's depicted in the movie. Okay. But to be able to get the movie made, to get people to go see it, right? <laughs> you, you have to do this. Okay. Also, the character that Don Cheadle played, a Sylvester. All right. Hopefully people, hopefully this is not a spoiler alert. It came out in 1997. So hopefully you've seen the movie by now, right? In the movie, Sylvester survives the massacre and he goes to a nearby city with man. They ride on horseback. In real life, he was killed. He didn't survive the massacre. When you actually study this, okay, Sylvester Carrier, okay, the character of Aunt Sarah. That was a real woman. That was played by Esther Rowe. All right. So when you do this research, right, you find that some of the things in the film were were real, but other things were created. All right. So by the 1920s, Rosewood's population of about 200 people was entirely African American, African American citizens, except for one white family who uh, ran the general store, and it was owned by John Wright, John Voight's character, all right? So when we look at 1923, so it's important anytime we deal with this history, right? Historical events don't ha happen in a vacuum. They are the result of a sequence of historical events taking place that lead up to a larger event happening, all right? So it's important for us to understand this. So 1923, if we go back, and if we go back, just, just let's go back to 1865. 1865, Civil War ends, June 2nd, 1865. December 6th, 1865, you have the um, the 13th Amendment is ratified, okay? And then it's adopted December uh, 18th, 1865, which legally frees the enslaved Africans, okay? Uh, the 13th Amendment. Okay, then from uh, 1865 to 1877, you have reconstruction that takes place. You're going to have African Americans, some of them former slaves, who become members of the House of Representatives. You're going to have a couple of uh, African Americans who are U.S. senators. You're going to have one that becomes a governor. All right. And we're going to make some type of advancements during Reconstruction. We're going to, to acquire some land. You have sharecropping going on. You have the sharecropping system. You have the black codes. You have a convict leasing system that's going to be used in the South from 1865 to 1928. And the black codes are going to regulate the movements of formerly enslaved Africans. Um, and, and in some Southern states, it's going to be required that we have labor contracts with plantations to lock us into the sharecropping system, all right? In Rosewood, this was a middle class. These were largely, uh, this was largely middle class African Americans, all right, in Rosewood, Florida. So uh, you have the compromise, you have the, uh, the compromise of 1877, which ends Reconstruction. You have Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, Supreme Court case 1896, which legalizes and cements um, Jim Crow segregation. You're going to have a uh, a rise in domestic terrorism, white domestic terrorism against African Americans uh, after Plessy versus Ferguson. You're going to have an increase in the numbers of Confederate monuments that are erected, also. Okay, during this period of time, uh, because of Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, and then also. Uh, so, so 1896 and on, you're going to have an increase in Confederate monuments as well, which were designed to terrorize African Americans and remind us of our low position in society. Okay, we uh, go into World War One, 1914 and 1918. Okay, the the Great Migration is going to start right about 1915 during World War One. In World War One, you have a uh, five million uh, men, mostly white men, who go and fight in the war. Okay, when they when they leave, they have jobs. Okay, when they come back, many of the jobs that they had were filled by African Americans and immigrants coming to this country, which created hostilities, which increased the hostilities between white men and African American men, especially because these were the ones filling these jobs. You're going to have the, the Great Migration starts right around 1915 to 1970. Five million to six million African Americans migrate from the migrate from the south, up north, and out west. 
okay, to fill these jobs is largely, so, so you, you have some migration going back earlier before that because of Henry Ford in Highland Park, Michigan, uh, and uh, Ford Motor Company. But the real boom is going to come because of World War I, all right? It's going to continue with World War II. What happens is when World War I ends in 1918, the next year is called the Red Summer, 1919, okay? And in 1919, you have over 25 major race rides across the country because when these African-American men come back after fighting in the war, you have what's called the New Negro. And the New Negro was, was African-Americans having a new sense of pride. These men said, look, we fought in this war. OK, we fought for America in this war. They said we're not coming back here and dealing with the same segregation. No, they're going to have to be some changes. So you had a new sense of pride. And then also many of these men, you know, who fight in the war, they learn how to fight. They learn how to shoot. OK, so uh, a lot of so in, in, in the film, he is a former a man, the character of man played by Bing Rames. He's a former World War One veteran. Right. He knows how to fight. He understands military strategy. OK. And you see him implementing military strategy when he's organizing the troops. The young boy named Arnett. His name is Arnett Doctor. He's a real character. He says, Arnett, you're my lieutenant. I need you to organize the, the children and, and the women. I need you to protect them, right? He's implementing military strategy and he knows how to fight. He carries two 45 caliber handguns. He knows how to use a rifle, all right? So this is something that African-American men learned in World War I, as well as the Civil War, okay? But we're talking about World War I right now. So in 1919, you have over 25 major race rides across this country. James Weldon Johnson, who wrote the uh, National Black Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, he called it the Red Summer because the streets of America were flowing with blood, all right? Let's back up a minute. February 8th, 1914, the film The Birth of a Nation debuts, right, which is seen all across the country, is viewed by Woodrow Wilson at the White House. The film, The Birth of a Nation, rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. You gotta understand a historical context that 1923 happens in. And this happened two years after the attack on Black Wall Street, June 1st, 1921, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you have to understand a historical context that these things take place in, all right? so. You have uh, the birth of a nation which rejuvenates the Ku Klux Klan because the Ku Klux Klan had pretty much died out by 1915. Uh, February 8th, 1915 is when it came out. February 8th, 1915. The Klan had pretty much died out because the Klan was founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, the same month that the 13th Amendment is ratified. All right. So the, the film, The Birth of a Nation, deals with slavery, civil war, and reconstruction in South in Piedmont, South Carolina. This is where it takes place. And the heroes of the film are the Ku Klux Klan, who put down a rebellion by former Union Negro soldiers, okay? And it shows the, these former Union Negro soldiers and these carpetbaggers coming from the North, these white Republicans coming from the North, taking over the town, pushing around uh, the white Southerners, things like this, right? So the heroes of the film are the Ku Klux Klan. The movie, The Birth of a Nation, before it was a movie, it was a play called The Klansman that traveled around the country. When it goes to Philadelphia, there were 3,000 African-Americans who protested against the play. We had protests against the movie, The Birth of a Nation, and, and the NAACP led these protests. When, when it goes to uh, Boston, I think it was, uh, William Monroe Trotter, William Monroe Trotter leads protests against the movie because we saw in the movie African-Americans being all the negative stereotypical images of us, but we also saw us being killed. We saw uh, black men raping white female virgins, all this depicted in the movie, The Birth of a Nation. We knew this was detrimental to our existence. 
existence. The movie and the play are based upon a novel by a man named Thomas Dixon called The Klansman. The Klansman. Research this. So when the movie The Birth of a Nation comes out, the Ku Klux Klan used this as a recruiting tool. So we see a huge rise in the Ku Klux Klan population from 1915 going into the 1920s, all right? Oftentimes in newspaper ads that advertise the film The Birth of a Nation, the Ku Klux Klan would take out a recruiting ad next to the uh, ad for The Birth of a Nation. So we, ha we have to understand the, the sequence of historical events leading up to January 1st, 1923. So you have, the, you have the rejuvenation of the Ku Klux Klan, which goes into the 1920s. And the 1920s are looked at really as the heyday of the Ku Klux Klan. They, they have three phases. They have the phase right after slavery, then they have the 1920s, and then they have the civil rights era. These are like three eras of the Ku Klux Klan. 19, uh, so we have the 1920s, we, we, 1920, we have the New Negro, uh, 1921, we have the attack on Black Wall Street, June 1st, 1921. Uh, I've done a two and a half hour lecture dealing with it. We have it at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I'm also in the documentary, Resurrecting Black Wall Street, The Blueprint of Dr. Boyce Watkins in Your Black World Films. Okay, so you have all this taking place. Then in um, 1922, you have, um, how's everybody doing? All right. Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also, okay? This is a history lesson for you. It's not African American History Month, but we deal with this type of history daily at the African History Network, right? Uh, then in 1922, you have a, uh, a incident that takes place as well. Blackpass.org has a good article dealing with this Rosewood Massacre, 1923, 1923, right? Prior, prior to the event that takes place November 1st, 1923, I'm going to get to that I'll talk about in just a minute. You had, an, it had uh, a series of incidents that stirred racial tensions in Rosewood. Now, during the previous winter, of 1922, a white school teacher from uh, Perry, Florida had been murdered. And on New Year's Eve of 1922, there was a Ku Klux Klan rally held in Gainesville, Florida, located not far from Rosewood. It's just a few miles from Rosewood. So while this was taking place, there were about 500 Klansmen at a rally in Gainesville, Florida, all right? This is, this is right around the time of January 1st, 1923, all right? So let's continue here. All right, so what happened was, and um, African-American business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com to find out how you can advertise with the African History Network, all right? And uh, also, if you like this type of information, you could donate to the African History Network, paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or go to our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. That helps us to keep doing the research, keep broadcasting our radio show Sunday nights, and uh, stay on the air, all right? Okay, so here's what happened. January 1st, 1923, in Sumner, Florida, 22-year-old Fanny Taylor, Fanny Taylor was the wife of a mill worker, okay? He was actually a foreman there at the mill plant. She was heard screaming by a neighbor. The neighbor found Fanny Taylor covered in bruises and claiming that a black man, a fictitious black man, had entered the house and assaulted her. We see this depicted in the movie, okay, Rosewood. Now, she did not say that she had been raped, only that she had been assaulted. But the word, quote unquote, assault was interpreted as a sexual violation by the white men and white people in her town of Sumner, Florida. She did not say she was raped. In the incident report, okay, that was taken by Sheriff Robert Elias Walker, and he's depicted in the film also. In the incident report, uh, Fanny, Fanny Taylor specified that she had not been raped, okay? 
But she lied and said that a black man had entered the house and assaulted her. That's not what happened. What happened was she was cheating on her husband with a white man and he beat her ass and she lied and said a black man did because she's trying to cover up the fact that she's cheating on her husband. Okay. So Fannie Taylor's husband, his name was John, James Taylor, and he was a foreman at the local mill plant. Okay. He escalated the situation by gathering an angry mob of white citizens to hunt down this fictitious black man who beat his wife. Okay. He also called for help from white, from white men in neighboring counties. Among them were a group of about 500 Ku Klux Klan members who were in Gainesville, Florida for a rally. This is the 23. So the Klan has been rejuvenated by then. This is after, this is eight years after the film, The Birth of a Nation came out, right? So the white mobs prowled the area woods searching for any black man they might find. And in the movie, when they found the fictitious character of man playing by being range, right? They catch him, put a rope on his, around his neck. They're going to hang him. But they said, they said they're looking for Jesse Hunter. They're looking for Jesse Hunter. Jesse Hunter was an African-American man who escaped from a nearby chain gang, right? And they suspected that he was the one who beat Fannie Taylor, but it wasn't. She made this black man up. Okay, so the white mobs are going to probe the area woods searching for any black man they might find. Okay, and they, and they would interrogate them. Are you Jesse Hunter? Where's Jesse Hunter? Blah, blah, blah. Right now, while the fear of black on white violence had been stoked across the uh, across the South since the days of slavery, particularly in areas where African-Americans outnumbered white people. Fannie Taylor's claim was especially pernicious. Now, Fannie Taylor's claim came within days of the uh, uh, not the, the days of the Ku Klux Klan rally near Gainesville, Florida, just north of Levi County or Levy County, L-E-V-Y, Levy County. With tensions high, her words set in motion six days of violence in which white men from Sumner, because it wasn't it wasn't white women out there with them doing the killing and the shoot. It was white men. OK, with white men from Sumner, Florida and neighboring towns and counties descended on Rosewood. OK, with the intent on finding this alleged assailant and lynching him. Now, law enforcement found out that an African-American prisoner, prisoner named Jesse Hunter had escaped the chain gang and immediately designated him as a suspect. And when you watch the movie, this is who they're looking for. When you watch the movie Rosewood, they keep talking about Jesse Hunter, Jesse Hunter. And because the fictitious character of man played by Bing Range, because he's new in town, he's a drifter, many, many of, the, um, of the white mob suspect that he's Jesse Hunter, all right? So the, the white mob focused their searches on Jesse Hunter, convinced that he was being hidden by the black residents there in Rosewood, Florida. Now, so when they go, when initially when they go and try to attack these homes, they were met by gunfire from Rosewood residents who had gotten word of the mob, of the white mob's approach and had barricaded themselves in their homes to make a stand. Women and children are, are going to end up fleeing to the woods for safety and waiting for days in the cold before a local train conductors, before uh, local train conductors were alerted to the violence and sent a train to rescue them. Some nearby white families are going to hide their black neighbors to protect them as well. So in the film, when you see the two white men that own a train and they come in and the, you have the children and uh, Elise Neal played the part of Scrappy and you have the other sister and they're hiding in the swamp and they're going to come and get on the get on that train to get out of there. That really happened. OK, there were two white men who owned the train. Now, I don't know if the I don't know if John Wright, who owned the general store, was the one who went and convinced them, as as we saw in the movie. But them taking some of them out on the train, that did happen. So as word of Fannie Taylor's claim spread, okay, some African-Americans in Rosewood who worked in Sumner, Florida, said the assailant had actually been Fannie Taylor's lover 
and her story was a cover up to spare her husband's wrath. So you saw this in the movie. The African Americans say, "No, no, no, no. We we know what's been going on." Okay, and and even towards the end, the sheriff in the movie gets into a fight with uh her her husband James Taylor, and he said, "Look, we all know what Fanny's been doing," and everybody starts laughing. They said after they after they kill after they kill another African American man. Uh, actually, in the movie, what happens is after Ving Range cuts him. Hopefully, this, hopefully you've seen the movie. This is not a spoiler alert, right? They 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 try to lynch him. Okay, then they get into a fight with each other. Uh, the sheriff gets into a fight with James Taylor. Everybody's distracted. He uh, Ving Range character pulls his pocket knife, his switchblade, out of his boot, and he and he cuts himself down. He um, First, he uh, uh, breaks his hands free of the rope. He loosens. It. He, he gets out of that because he ties hands behind his back. He pulls his knife out, cuts his cuts himself down, and then he jumps on his horse, Booker T. Okay. So the sheriff says, "Look," he said, uh, uh, "This guy probably had nothing to do with this, and most likely none of them did." In the movie, it it appears in the movie they kill more than were actually killed by the actual account. I'm not sure. So he says, um, uh, he says everybody knows what Fanny's been doing, and all these white men who've been shooting and killing, they all start laughing because they know they know this white woman lied, but they just wanted to go raid this town and kill some people, right? So as word of Fanny Taylor's claim spread, some black people in Rosewood who worked in Sumner, Florida, said the assailant had actually been Fannie Taylor's lover, a white man, and her story was a cover to spare her husband's wrath, according to Professor Maxine Jones, who is a um, professor of African-American history at Florida State University, okay? And she co-authored an account of the massacre for the Florida State Legislature in 1994. All right. So if we look at um, Aaron Carrier, we look at some of the key figures here. Aaron Carrier. Now, searches were led by dogs to the home of Aaron Carrier in Rosewood, Florida. Aaron Carrier was the nephew of Sarah Carrier, or who in the film they call Aunt Sarah, depicted by Esther Rowe, who we know as Florida Evanson Good Times. And Sarah Carrier, Aunt Sarah, did laundry for the Taylor family family, James Taylor and Fanny Taylor. The horde of white men dragged uh, Aaron Carrier out of his house, tied him to a car and dragged him to Sumner, Florida, where he was cut loose and beaten. Sheriff Walker intervened, putting uh, Aaron Carrier in his car and driving him to Gainesville, Florida, where he was placed under the protective custody of the sheriff there. Okay. Now you have another a real person, Sam Carter. Sam Carter um, was a blacksmith, okay? And you had another mob of white men who showed up at the home of Sam Carter, torturing him until he admitted that he was hiding Jesse Hunter and agreed to take them to the hiding spot. There, but Jesse Hunter wasn't there. Jesse Hunter, even though Jesse Hunter was somebody who escaped from a chain gang, Jesse Hunter was not the one who beat Fanny Taylor's behind, beat her Fanny. He was not the one who was hiding out or anything like that. No. OK, so uh, Aaron, uh, Sam Carter led them into the woods. But when Jesse Hunter failed to appear, someone in the mob shot him. His body was hung on a tree before the mob moved on. The sheriff's office had attempted and failed to break up white mobs and advised African-American workers to stay in their places of employment for safety. OK, then you have Sarah Carrier, who was called Aunt Sarah. On January 4th, 1923, a group of 20 to 30 white men approached the Carrier home and shot the family dog. When Sylvester's mother, Sylvester, so in the movie, he's played by Don Cheadle, Sylvester Carrier. When Sylvester's mother, Sarah Carrier, came to the porch to confront the mob, they shot and killed him. OK. Sylvester Carrier defended his home, killing two men and wounding four, two white men, okay, and wounding four white men in the ensuing battle before he too was killed. So in the movie, 
you see Don Cheadle's character, a Sylvester Carrier, surviving and making it out on horseback along with the fictitious character of man. And they're going to, they, they tell the people on the train, Scrappy and the other sister and the children, we'll meet you in the nearby town, okay? But that's not what happened. Sylvester Carey was actually killed also. So the remaining survivors fled to the swamps for refuge where many of the African-American residents of Rosewood had already retreated hoping to avoid the rising conflict and increasing racial tension. As many as 25 people, mostly children, had taken refuge in the home of Sarah Carrier, Aunt Sarah, when on the night of January 4th, armed whites surrounded the house and the beleased Jesse Hunter was hiding there, okay? All right, so, um, so the gun battle and the standoff lasted uh, overnight, it ended when the door was broken down by white attackers. The children inside the house escaped through the back door and made their way to safety through the woods where uh, where they're going to hide. OK, that's what's taking place at her house. Uh, so you're going to have violence that escalates also in Rosewood. This is January 4th. So it starts January 1st. OK, with Fanny Taylor lie, lying about what happened. All right. So this is January 4th. We have incidents taking place January 5th and January 6th, as well as January 7th. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your uh, Facebook page. Okay, invite your friends to tune in also on YouTube, on social media. Uh, if you're just tuning in, this is Michael M. Hotel, host of the African History Network show, founder of the African History Network. And uh, we wanna let you know, African American business owners, supposed to name your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Also, if you like this type of information, be sure to, uh, register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. We have them in a bundle pack, a 10 course bundle pack. It's regularly $130. We have a weekend promotion. They're on sale for only $40. It includes understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? And that is a, a, a 14 hour, seven session online course. And it's taught by yours truly. We have a power, we do a PowerPoint presentation, we have video clips, uh, we have articles, book references, and it also includes great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, it includes a presentation I did dealing with the film Black Panther and some others. So it was on sale right now, it's a weekend promotion. It's on sale, $40, regularly $130. It's all on demand. Watch from around the world. Watch as many times as you want to, okay? That's a 10-course online bundle pack. So if you like this type of information, that online bundle pack will blow you away. We just posted a link here. It's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, all right? Okay, let's continue. And um, we've got Keith, Ramona, some of the people watching, Carla, Gigi. Uh, yeah, go back and watch that movie as well, because if you watch that movie, then certain things are going to jump out after you watch this uh, broadcast here. Certain things are going to jump out at you after you uh, watch that movie. OK. Also, we have the um, eight digit, the Black Panther eight digital download bundle pack, regularly eighty dollars on sale, thirty dollars as well. Includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther and uh, really is nine because you get my Kwanzaa presentation as well. OK. Uh, we just posted the link that's at africanhistorynetwork.com and that helps us to keep doing what we're doing as well all right okay let's continue here okay so in rosewood the violence is going to escalate and it's going to continue into january 5th 6th and 7th so news of the standoff at the carrier house is going to spread with newspapers inflating the number of people who were dead and falsely reporting that bands of armed African-American citizens are going on a rampage. That's not what happened. It was white people on a rampage killing innocent and shooting innocent African-Americans, torturing them. That's what happened. It wasn't bands of armed black citizens going on a rampage, no. But this is what, just like some of the newspapers lie today, this is what was taking place then that inflamed tensions okay and we saw the same thing happen in uh black wall street the white newspapers there lying about what's happening inflaming tensions as well 
So um, even more white men are going to pour into the area believing that a race war had, bro had broken out. Now, on January 5th, 1923, the white mob burned the uh, carrier home before joining with a group of uh, 200 men from surrounding towns who had heard erroneously that a black man had killed two white men, okay? But apparently they didn't know the full circumstances behind this, okay? And, and we know Sylvester Carrier, he shot and killed two white men, okay, who were there at, at his home threatening he and the people inside. So as night descended on the night of January 5th, the mob attacked the town of Rosewood, slaughtering animals and burning buildings. An official report claims six African Americans were killed along with two whites. Other accounts suggest a larger total, okay? So it's hard to, I, I haven't been able to find a real accurate count of how many were killed, I don't know. I know in the film, they show them digging a mass grave and dumping black bodies into it. Looks like maybe 20, 30, something like that or more. So I, I don't know. Now at the end of the carnage, at the end of the carnage in Rosewood, only two buildings remain standing. A house and the town general store. The, the general store was owned by the white man, John Wright. And he was hiding out African-Americans at his house also, okay? So he was, he was one of the heroes who helped protect African-Americans as well, okay? He was, one of, he was one of the heroes. So some of the first targets of the influx were the churches in Rosewood, which were burned down. Houses were then attacked, first setting fire to them and then shooting people as they escaped from the burning buildings. Lexi Gordon, L-E-X-I-E, -E, Lexi Gordon was one of those who were killed, one of those who were murdered, taking a gunshot to her face as she hid under her burning house. Lexi Gordon had sent her children fleeing when white attackers approached, but suffering from typhoid fever, she stayed behind. Many Rosewood citizens fled to the nearby swamps for safety, spending, spending days hiding in the swamps. Some attempted to leave the swamps, but were turned back by men working for the sheriff. James Carrier, James Carrier, who was the brother to Sylvester Carrier and son of Sarah Carrier or Aunt Sarah, did manage to get out of the swamp and take refuge with the help of a local turpentine factory manager. A white mob found him anyhow and forced him to dig a grave for himself before murdering him. Others found help from white families willing to shelter, willing to shelter them, okay? All right, so if we look at John and William Bryce, John and William Bryce, and these were um, two real, men also, we saw them depicted in the film, they owned the train, okay? Many of the black residents of Rosewood who fled to uh, the swamps were evacuated on January 6th, 1923, by two local train conductors, John and William Bryce. Many others were hidden by John Wright, the owner of the general store. Um, and then other African-American residents of Rosewood fled to Gainesville, Florida, and to northern cities also. As a consequence of the massacre, Rosewood became deserted. And Rosewood was actually, because of this massacre, Rosewood was wiped off of the map also, okay? Because I remember here back around the time the film came out, and even before then, because the lawsuit was in 19, 1993, and then going into 94. And I remember hearing stories about this in the news about Rosewood. And then the movie came out and they talked about how the, how the town of Rosewood was actually wiped off the map, okay? So aware of the violence in Rosewood and familiar with the population, the Bryce brothers, John and William Bryce, drove their train to the area and invited escapees, okay? The African-American escapees, those that had been hiding out in the swamp, things like this. Uh, they invited them to get on the train and they would take them out to another city. However, they refused to take African-American men because they were afraid of being attacked by white mobs if they had African-American men on the train. And, and we saw this depicted in the film also because 
when man played by Bing Rams is on the train. There's an African American man who tries to, he's running alongside the train. He tries to get on and man hits him in the head with the gun and keep him off the train. Okay. So we saw this depicted in the movie also. Um, so many of those who fled by train have been hidden in the home of the white general store owner, John Wright, and continue to do so throughout the violence. Sheriff Walker helped terrified residents make their way to John Wright, okay, and to his house, who would then arrange his escape with the help of the Bryce brothers, okay? So with all this taking place, you have to ask the question, well, what was Florida's reaction? What did the governor do? What happened, right? So Florida governor at the time, his name was Carrie Hardy, or Carrie Hardy, Carrie Hardy, C-A-R-Y. Hardy, H-A-R-D-E-E. -E. Governor Hardy offered to send the National Guard to help, but Sheriff Walker declined the help believing he had the situation under control. Apparently he did not. So mobs of white men began to disperse after several days. But on January 7th, 1923, Many returned to Rosewood, Florida to finish off the town, burning what little remained of it to the ground, except for the home of John Wright. And they didn't burn his store either, okay? So John Wright, they didn't burn, he's the white man who owned the general store. They did not burn his store and did not burn his town, burn his house. A special grand jury and a special prosecutor were appointed by the governor, Governor Hardy, uh, to investigate the violence. The jury heard the testimonies of nearly 30 witnesses, mostly white, over several days, but claimed to find, but claimed not to find enough evidence for prosecution. Okay? They heard all the all these witnesses, but there was not enough evidence of prosecution. Okay. The surviving citizens of Rosewood, Florida did not return, fearful that the horrific bloodshed would recur. All right. So when we look at the legacy of Rosewood, what took place after that? The story of Rosewood, Florida and the massacre that happened would fade away quickly. Most newspapers stopped reporting on it soon after the violence had ceased and many survivors kept quiet about their experience even to subsequent family members, okay? The initial report of the Rosewood incident presented less than a month after the massacre claimed there was insufficient evidence for prosecution. Thus, no one was no one was charged with any of the Rosewood murders. In 1982, a journalist by the name of Gary Moore, who was a journalist for the St. Petersburg Times, resurrected the history of Rosewood, Florida through a series of articles that gained national attention. The living survivors of the massacre uh, at, at, at this point were all in their 80s and 90s, okay? And they came forward. They were led by Rosewood descendant Arnett Doctor and demanded restitution from Florida. Arnett was a survivor. Arnett is depicted in the film. He's a little he's a little boy in the film, and the character of man tells him, You're my lieutenant, okay? I need you to organize these children and women. I need you to protect them, things like this, right? Now, Professor Maxine Jones, professor of African American history at Florida State University, and five colleagues wrote the account of the incident, the massacre in Rosewood, Florida in support of a lawsuit against the state of Florida by some of the survivors who had been children at the time. Because of fear, the massacre had, quote, remained a family secret for years, end quote, said Professor Maxine Jones. Quote, not knowing who you could trust and believing people with white skin could get back at you, end quote not knowing who you could trust and believing people with white skin could get back at you, quote unquote. So it's going to be Arnett Doctor who finally decides to speak out and seek redress and he's going to lead the survivors in this lawsuit. Based on his account and those of surviving eyewitnesses and 
the report from Maxine Jones and five of her colleagues. The Florida State Legislature approved a $2.1 million settlement in 1994. The governor also, at the time, the governor in Florida also issued an apology on behalf of the state for not bringing perpetrators of the destruction to justice, not sending, nor, and also for not sending officials to quell the violence and rescue the innocent. The action led to the passing of a bill awarding them uh, $2.1 million and created an educational fund for descendants of the Rosewood Massacre. The bill also called for an investigation into the matter to clarify the events, which um, uh, Moore took part in also, okay? And uh, I forgot Moore's first name. And then we're going to see, um, so this is in this is in ninety four, and then we're going to see the um, uh, we're going to see the film Rosewood, which took place in uh, Gary Moore. Okay, uh, I think they're referring to Gary Moore. Okay, yeah, the 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 a report of Gary Moore. Okay, the bill also called for an investigation into the matters to clarify the events. And uh, Gary Moore took part in this investigation also. All right, so then the film uh, directed by John Singleton, who directed uh, Boys in the Hood, came out in 1997, which dramatized these events. And it was largely it was based on a true story, even though they took some creative licenses. And, you know, I'm not beating up on John Singleton because that helped, that movie really helped to get that story out even more, even after the lawsuit. Um, so. This is why when you see a movie that's based on a true story, you have to go back and like actually research the story to, to be able to separate fact from fiction. Because if you don't, I mean, you just sit up and believe that everything you saw in the movie was true and it's not necessarily true, even though it's based upon some real events, okay? All right, let's go to some of your comments. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on Facebook page, hope uh, in your social media platforms, hopefully, you learn something, hopefully you like this type of information. How you all like this type of information, okay? And let's go to some of your comments here. African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. But this time, back in 1923, this was going on in um, Rosewood, Florida, okay? The massacre in Rosewood. All right, let's see, we have Davidson, Zaire, uh, and those in Detroit, hey, I'll be at the Muslim Center tonight, uh, 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. for the Winter Festival. Um, we have the information on our Facebook fan page, uh, so check that out. Also, those in the Detroit area, 1605 West Davidson. I'll be a vendor there as well. They do it each year. It's been a few years since I've been there. It's open, it's open to the public. It's family fun also. Uh, so it's at the Muslim Center uh, this, uh, this evening. Okay, January 5th, 2019. All right, let's see. Uh, to the to point they wouldn't stand up for themselves. Zaire, what are you talking about? Really sad how we allow white folks to input fear in us. That's sad. Well, there's a history behind it. But you, you, always, you usually had a lot of African Americans who fought back. Even in uh, Black Wall Street, okay? See, in my research on Black Wall Street, you had a lot of... Uh, retired World War One veterans who lived in Black Wall Street, and they shot back. That's not talked about a lot in the history. Okay, in, in my in my lecture dealing with the history of Black Wall Street, I deal with this. You had two hundred armed African American men who go to the jail where Dick Rowland. Dick Rowland was the nineteen year old shoe shine boy who was accused of of raping and assaulting um, Sarah, the white the white girl Sarah there in um, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he's in the jail and there's a mob of 500 white men who are armed that want to take him out and lynch him. You have 200 armed African-American men who go to the jail to back the sheriff up and protect Dick Rock. Okay? See, that, that part of the story of Black Wall Street is not talked about. And then when the mob comes in, uh, June 1st, uh, 
1921, all right, you had African-American men who shot back also. Because we, you had a lot of retired World War I veterans that lived there in North Tulsa. North Tulsa is where the African-Americans live. South Tulsa is where the white people live. What separated South Tulsa from North Tulsa was the uh, railroad track, as well as segregation, but the railroad track. Okay, Carla Hornbuckle uh, said, was told, was what they told at the end of movie about reparations to these families of the murder of black people. They claimed they did not know of how many were murdered. Yeah, they got, the, the survivors got some type of reparations. It's still unclear how many were murdered. I see accounts of six African-Americans, two white men, but it's, just, it's suspected that it was much larger. The same thing with Black Wall Street. We don't, you know, the Red Cross said it was 300 people who were killed, but there were reports of, we do, we also know that a lot of African-Americans were shot and wounded and fled Black Wall Street, fled North Tulsa, went into surrounding towns and died there. There are reports of seeing people dumping black bodies into the river, things like this in, 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 in Black Wall Street. So the Red Cross, the Red Cross is going, and, and when you study Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the one, the entire town was not destroyed. It was, a lot of it was destroyed, but the entire town was not destroyed. The Booker T. Washington High School wasn't destroyed. The Booker T. Washington High School is where the American Red Cross set up a makeshift hospital. Okay, to tend to the wounded. Um, then also, African Americans are going to rebuild Black Wall Street, and we rebuilt it with our own dollars. That's the other part that's not talked about. Okay, uh, David Neely, how you doing? Bruce Johnson said, "Great job, Carla." Saw this movie several times. Great movie, but made me angry every time I watched it. Yeah, me too. All right, <laughs> it, it, it made me angry and sad. But we, we but we need to study the real history behind what we see on the screen also, okay? We need to study the real history as well. Um, Bruce, the movie don't show Rosewood gain their wealth. It only show Esther Rowe going over to the neighboring county, Sumner, selling eggs. Also, they don't talk about how after the massacre, the United States, uh, let's see. It's a long message here. How after the massacre, the United States government took Rosewood off the United States map as it never existed. Yeah, yeah, that, that happened. Uh, but Rosewood was largely a middle class African American town. Okay. Uh, Robert loved it, loved the education. Doretha said history repeats itself. Sandra said terrible. Sasha said, Thank you, Brother Mike. You're doing awesome work. All right, thank you. This is now making sense, Sophia said. Okay. All right, I saw the movie first time watching. All right. Yeah, so um, it's a powerful movie, Rosewood. It's, it's an even more powerful history behind the movie, all right? Okay, so um, African-American business owners, uh, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We know it's the beginning of the year. Uh, African-American business owners are trying to figure out how do we tap into new markets? How do we bring on new customers? Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We take your 30 second to 60 second audio commercial. If you don't have one, we will create one for you at no additional charge. We put it into the audio podcast of our Sunday night show, the African History Network show. I've been hosting the African History Network show. This is the ninth year of it, March 10th. Uh, 2019, it will be nine years exactly. And we broadcast uh, We broadcast the show Sunday nights. And in the audio podcast, we uh, put your 30 second and 60 second commercial. We're on six different podcast platforms. We're on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, CastBox, Acast, FM Player, and TuneIn. Okay, TuneIn, T-U-N-E. And each episode we reach thousands of uh, people across the country and even outside the country. All right. So uh, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Our current promotion running a few more days. Uh, you, you get 50 percent off your first month. Second month is free. 50 percent off your first month. Second month is free. All right. And then also we have a weekend sale going on right now at africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, we have the uh, eight digital download uh, bundle pack with the ninth presentation also 
on sale thirty dollars regularly uh eighty dollars just the uh, black panther eight digital download bundle pack includes three of my presentations dealing with the film black panther five other presentations including the lecture i did dealing with the history of the tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis on the negro male then i separate fact from fiction there as well and then also you get my kwanzaa presentations uh that i did um uh that, that i just did in uh december 2018 for kwanzaa okay from kwanzaa to wakanda from kwanzaa to wakanda reconnecting african americans to african culture for self and power all right we'll be live on the air sunday night uh on 9 10 a.m wfdf the super station here in detroit for the african history network show we'll be live on the air we broadcast on facebook live sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m eastern standard time so tune in for that also as well we'll talk some about rosewood we'll talk some about boris kojo hosting uh, a group of about 40 african-american celebrities in ghana to reconnect to african history and culture we'll talk about um some other things as well congressional black caucus 55 members in the cbc five members chairing committees uh i think we'll talk some about uh uh, the sister Jasmine, who was assaulted uh, at the McDonald's and fought back. Uh, and we talk, we'll talk about some other times. I have it laid out. I don't have it all in front of me right now. Okay. Those in Detroit, they will see you at the Muslim Center. Okay. Uh, Saturday, 5 p.m. to uh, 11 p.m. is uh, open uh, to the family. We have the information here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And you don't have to be a Muslim to attend. I'm not a Muslim, but I've been to the Muslim Center before. A lot of people there know me. It's in Detroit. Some of those people listen to my show, follow me here on the African History Network. So we'll have, we'll have a vendor table. We'll have our DVD lectures there also. A lot of, a lot of them will be on sale. The Kwanzaa and uh, January sale continues. All right, so hey, we have to get out of here. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself, okay? Remember, right now it's corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. All right. Okay. Hey, I forgot to um, show you. Uh, I forgot to talk about my sources so you can do more research and show you a couple pictures here as well dealing with uh, Rosewood. Okay. See if I can show you some of these pictures. Um, so once again, this is Michael M. Hotep, host of the African History Network show, founder of the African History Network. All right, so check out uh, history.com has a good article dealing with uh, Rosewood. It's called Rosewood Massacre, history.com. They have a good article. Also, Atlanta Journal Constitution, AJC.com, Atlanta Journal Constitution. They have a good article as well entitled The Rosewood Massacre, How a Lie Destroyed a Black Town. The Rosewood Massacre, How a Lie Destroyed a Black Town. Blackpast.org has a good article, Rosewood Massacre 1923. Past.org, Rosewood Massacre 1923. The Guardian has a good article also, a pretty extensive article. Um, Theguardian.com, Rosewood Massacre, A Harrowing Tale of Racism and the Road Toward Reparations. Okay, Washington Post has a uh, article also called Rosewood uh, from May 30th, 1993 by William Booth. Uh, Washington Post has a good article also called Rosewood. All right, if we look at uh, uh, very quickly here, I'll try to show you this, uh, this picture here. If we look at this, this is from the article from uh, The Guardian, okay? and uh, Rosewood Massacre, a harrowing, a harrowing tale of racism and the road toward reparation. So this scene right here, this picture, this is from, um, uh, this is in 1923, it says the ruins of the, of the two-story shanty near Rosewood, Florida in 1923, where black residents barricaded themselves and uh, fought off a band of whites, okay? So we have this picture here, 
Uh, we have a picture. We talked about Aaron Carrier. Aaron Carrier. This is his wife, uh, Maholda. Maholda, I guess is how you pronounce her name, M-A-H-U-L-D-A. She was a school teacher. Maholda fled to the bedroom each time a car drove down the rural road. They talk about Maholda. She survived the massacre. And they talk about how uh, in the nearby town where she lived, uh, anytime a car drove by, she ran into the bedroom. She, she, she's basically suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. She's terrorized by this, okay? It talks about how, um, uh, let's see, uh, four black children, four black school children raced home along a dirt road in Archer, Florida in 1944, kicking up a dust, uh, kicking up a dust cloud uh, wake as they ran. They were under strict orders from their mother to run not lollygag or walk or jog, but run directly home after hitting the road's curve, the road's curve. Um, and then they they talk about, let's see here, um, explanations for demands to hide came later when uh, Jenkins' mother, Teresa Brown Robinson, whispered to her daughter uh, the story of violence that befell the settlement of Rosewood in 1923. Uh, despite, uh, let's see, despite strict adherence to their mother's orders, the siblings weren't told why they should race home in 1944 to the children. It was one of several mysterious dictates issued during childhood in the Jim Crow South. As uh, uh, Jenkins uh, tells it, and that is uh, Lizzie Jenkins, at least it used to be Lizzie Robin Robinson, now it's Lizzie Jenkins. As Jenkins, Jenkins tells it, the children did not know why Amos and Andy was often interrupted by revving, by revving engines and calls from her mother to, quote, go upstairs now, end quote, or why Aunt Maholda Carrier, a school teacher, fled to the bedroom each time a car drove down the rural road. Explanations for demands to hide came later uh, when Jenkins' mother, Teresa Brown Robinson, uh, whispered to her daughter the story of violence that befell the settlement of Rosewood in 1923. All right, and then uh, this is, let's bring the share back up. This is a uh, picture here of uh, a house, a black resident's home is shown in flames during the race ride in 1923, okay? And then also, now this is um, the sheriff of Levi County, or Levy County, Sheriff Bob Walker, Sheriff Bob Walker. And the caption here says he holds a shotgun allegedly used by Sylvester Carter, I'm oh, sorry, Sylvester Carrier, Sylvester Carrier, who is an African-American resident of Rosewood, who we talked about. This is the shotgun Sylvester Carrier allegedly used to shoot and kill two deputized white men who were at his door in 1923. Okay, this is uh, Sheriff uh, Bob Walker, all right? And uh, here we have um, Sarah Carrier, Aunt Sarah, Sarah Carrier uh, on the left and Sylvester Carrier standing up and Willie Carrier as well, okay? And these pictures here. Here's a picture, a crowd of white citizens of Sumner, Florida near the scene are, are shown in 1923. And um, Rosewood was 37 miles southeast of Archer, Florida, on the main road to uh, the Gulf. Here's a, uh, a marker, a historical marker, talking about Rosewood, Florida also, okay? So those are some uh, pictures. Check out the article from uh, The Guardian, okay? Check out the article from The Guardian. And then there's a uh, big picture. Uh, there's a big picture here from uh, the article from history.com also, uh, which is more of a close-up to one of the ones they showed um, from The Guardian, okay? This is the remains of a shanty, burnt down shanty uh, near Rosewood, Florida, okay? Where African-Americans hid and, and fought against the white mob. This is the article, Rosewood Massacre from history.com, okay? All right. So look, we have to get out of here. Just wanted to show that to you and give you those sources also. 
All right, talk to y'all later. Right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Check out the first broadcast as well. You can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. You can order our DVD lectures, also uh, our digital downloads, and sign up for the online courses I teach. They're all on demand. Watch at your own pace. Watch around the world. It's all at africanhistorynetwork.com. Talk to you.